So, okay. Uh, it's been quite an unusual year, as we all know. And, um, and with that, um, have come many, many changes that actually were unexpected. Alan, if we could move to the, to the next slide, I'll begin to go through that. What we really felt like 1099 compliance um, might be less of a priority in 2020. Um, and uh, unfortunately, like the opposite has been true. Um, we all know about the unemployment numbers, which seem to spike in April. While they're beginning to settle down now, and, and we see industries that really continue to hire more people, um, one of the things that's happening is we still have at least 19 million people receiving unemployment benefits, which is an extremely high number. And um, most states, their fiscal year begins on July 1. And as a result of all of the unemployment, what we're seeing is their expected tax revenues um, are as low or maybe even lower um, than the years where the Great Recession was at its deepest. And so um, you're beginning to see states really figure out what the next year will look like for them. And in many cases, when they look at the general tax funds or all their tax funds, it's, it's a bleak picture. Um, Alan, if we could move forward one more and we'll, we'll kind of talk through what some of that looks like. You can see here, especially when you look at the lines uh, that, that are highlighted in red on your right, for example, the, the state of California, as a result of COVID-19 and all the unemployment, they're looking at their general tax fund uh, deficiencies over the next year, maybe being reduced by as many as 17 to 21 percent. When you look at that in dollars, it's approximately $24 billion uh, or more. Um, this is significant. You know, Colorado, Illinois, New York, really all states are in the same boat. So when you look at, you know, why has legislation continued at, at this dramatic pace, even in 2020, why is this such a high priority? The reality is the revenues are not coming in for the states. Um, there was already a tax gap issue because more and more workers begin to engage in, in this gig economy and, and engage as 1099s, um, which has been uh, noted as from most states as, you, you know, wow, the, the tax coffers were really feeling the impact of that. Now, when you throw COVID-19 on top of that, it's truly a force multiplier um, for tax revenues. And so when the revenues are not coming in, the reality is uh, the, the main course of action that states have uh, is policy change and legislation change. And that's what we're seeing. And we're seeing it come at a very, very rapid pace. It's tough to keep up. And so the goal of today is really to bring you up to speed on everything that's happened um, in the beginning of 2020, really through this first half, not only from a legislation change perspective, but also really the ways that the courts are interpreting existing laws and new laws, um, it, it's quite unusual. So um, all of this comes together to create a perfect storm. And I wanna hand this over to Rob, uh, our, our expert, who can begin to walk you through what those legislative changes are and what they have been for the first half of 2020. Rob? Patrick, thanks, that's, that's great. Um, and so we'll start here in the past with California's AB5. Um, so I guess I could say it all started with, with a spark or, uh, or perhaps I should say a long smolder of a case that first was started in 2005. That case was called Dynamex or Dynamics Operations West Inc. versus Superior Court of Los Angeles. Um, all the way back in 2005, that started. In 2018, the decision came down in that case, which gave rise to what many know that's the three-pronged uh, indige indigestion-inducing test called the ABC test. We're going to talk more about that test, uh, but that's sort of this catalyst moment towards the end of uh, 2018. This ABC test basically became the de facto standard before it was law, but law would soon follow uh, thanks to Democratic Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez of San Diego, who authored Assembly Bill 5 or AB 5. And this would be codified as law in California in January 2020. So January 1 this year. Um, since then, AB5 has either been pilloried or exalted, mostly over the second prong of the test. Uh, that prong, that B prong or second prong on the slide you can see here, 
says that the worker, uh, in order to for someone to be an independent contractor, the worker has to be performing tasks that are outside of the usual course of the company's business activities. So uh, <clears throat> this is a sort of a exacting but still nebulous standard. What's outside of the course of businesses' activities? It's caused a large upheaval and again a lot of indigestion um, amongst companies trying to contract with independent contractors. So now, since January one, we work within that law. And we work within that law's exceptions um, to still work every day with independent contractors in California. In other words, there are still independent contractors in California, um, and we watch the update to see what will happen next. Now, one thing is for sure, since AB5 landed, the IC space has been extremely active. Um, and with all of the goings on this year, it would have been easy to miss some very important items. So as Patrick said, we're here to catch you up. Next slide, please. Here we have a timeline of lava flowing. Um, I think given the first six, seven months of this year, it's, it's really not slow moving lava. It's probably more like the ash, the, the, the pyroclastic flow, I guess you could say, the, the, that spreads out from a volcano. So things have been moving fast. Um, I'll go through some of these. Many of these I'm going to touch on more in depth later on, but uh, briefly. January 1st, California's AB5 went into effect. Um, this isn't the first ABC test that's on the books. We're going to talk about Massachusetts. It has this same ABC test in that state, and it's existed for 15, 16, 17 years. Um, but for whatever reason, the notoriety, the headlines, uh, the news around California's, California's AB5 and ABC test have seemed to springboard many other legislative uh, and case law activity. Uh, for instance, a week later on January 8th, uh, New York Governor Cuomo announced that he plans to follow uh, California's lead. Uh, he, he famously said that we need to be tougher um, on worker misclassification than California. So he's taken that position. Um, later on in, in that uh, same month, January, New Jersey's governor signed a package of six bills to crack down on worker misclassification. We're going to go over some of those as well. Um, Jump to March, and we have something interesting here, the Federal CARES Act, as we all know. Uh, the Federal CARES Act has come about since the pandemic. Um, this, the, the part here that uh, you're probably aware of, uh, but that's worth pointing out, is that this is a law that provides employee type of benefits to independent contractors, technically imply, uh, applying employee benefits to non-employees. So um, this, this was kind of a bit of a sea change, too, and we have to ask ourselves, and we'll talk more about that later, is this a portent of things to come? Skip down to a few days in California, um, a couple very uh, vocal, uh, well-funded groups, including Uber and DoorDash, uh, are put, put together a group of signatures to get a law on the books to stop AB5 from being um, enforced. We'll touch, we'll, we'll touch upon that as well. Moving to May, California using, or I like to say sometimes weaponizing AB5, filed a lawsuit against Uber and Lyft, saying your drivers are not, uh, are, are not independent contractors and employees, and we're going to sue to make sure that that changes. Um, skipping ahead to July, Virginia, we'll get into that. They also signed a series of employment-related bills uh, that dramatically redefine their own employment laws, and, and they focus on worker misclassification. That one's interesting as well, because Virginia is often considered a really a sort of pro-business state. This was a bit of a pivot that took some people by surprise, and we'll discuss that a bit further too. Uh, on July 2nd, so just this month, the Department of Labor announced that it aimed to fast-track the worker misclassification rule to actually, in the last six months of the year, um, get a rule in place through notice period and actually in place. Uh, this is a really aggressive timeline. It's an accelerated plan. Uh, proposing and finalizing the regulation uh, usually takes longer than that. So there's a couple thoughts, a couple thoughts about why the, the, the sort of sped up timeline here. Well, you could have a possible change in administration coming at the end of the year. So the current administration wants to put together, put a rule out there. Um, generally speaking, what's that rule going to look like? Well, we don't know yet. The Department of Labor hasn't said, uh, but it's certain to look to relax standards from some of these stringent uh, worker misclassification tests. And then lastly, on this slide, um, July 14th, so just, I don't know, seven, eight days ago, Massachusetts 
uh, also sued Uber and Lyft. Uh, and we'll be going over that as well. So, I mean, if you look at this slide, we're not just talking about California. Um, we're, we're, you see on here, New York, New Jersey, the federal level, Virginia. So you have the South, the Northeast, you have the Department of Labor, you have Massachusetts. And this is all in the space of half of a, half of a year. And, and this list, by the way, isn't even exhausted, exhausting. Excuse me. You also have uh, states like Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Tennessee that have uh, just put forth a, the 20-factor IRS test. They've adopted that as the test in their state. So, you know, for good or bad or whatever way you look at uh, the legislation and its effects, there is a, a ton going on. You can move to the next slide. We'll dive into Virginia. As I mentioned, Virginia passed um, really three significant laws. Um, these went into effect uh, at the beginning of July. So this started at the beginning of the year. Um, even with you know COVID and the pandemic, these laws still came. These laws still are going into for, uh, into action. So what we like to say is that you know even during this time. Uh, you're not seeing really a slowdown. Um, in some cases, you are. We'll talk about that. But you're not seeing a full stop on proposed legislation uh, around worker misclassification. Um, so specifically, what do these some of these Virginia laws do? Well, around November 2019, uh, a Virginia task force on misclassification found, among other things, that Virginia had a misclassification problem. They found that Virginia was misclassifying uh, 214,000 uh, workers a year. They felt that that was costing Virginia about $28 million a year. As Patrick said, those tax coffers, the revenue that, that states really, really need more than ever now is being recognized around worker misclassification. This is a way we can get it back. So a few of the things that this does that were not there before um, in Virginia, it creates a private right of action. So it allows any individual who is not properly classified as an employee to bring a civil action directly against their employer for failing to, to properly classify them. Um, and there is, I, I should say on that, there is a knowledge requirement. So the employer has to have known that they were misclassifying them, but it does provide that civil remedy directly to, uh, directly to a worker. A couple things about this, too, that are different in the state of uh, Virginia now. There's a presumption, express presumption on this law that uh, anyone that you're paying is an employee. So there's an employee presumption. It's really important to know. What that means is that even if you pay someone as an independent contractor, if you're challenged under uh, Virginia law, you, the employer, or the employer, the contracting entity, you have the burden of proof to prove that uh, your classification is correct. So you got to overcome that. Um, another important part of these laws, a suite of laws here in Virginia, is that they're expressly going to be using the IRS's 20 factors. So this is different than the ABC test. You know, you've got that slide with the ABC test. It's three prongs. The IRS 20 factors, um, this is a totality of the circumstances kind of review. Many people listening are probably familiar with that. There's many factors, sub factors. Um, so that could be good or bad. Under the IRS standard, it could be easier for you to defend as a company, defend your position, your classification, because you've got more to work with than just an ABC test where you've got to satisfy all these three prongs. If one of them isn't satisfied, you've misclassified. <clears throat> so that's uh, so that's the first one I'll go over in Virginia. Another one is a anti-retaliation against employees law. So you know it basically is what what it sounds like. Um, if you're a company, you can't retaliate against anyone who claims that they're misclassified or anyone who takes part in that proceeding, you know, sort of the, the discovery. So if we ask another worker, do you think this person was misclassified? We do some due diligence on that. You can't retaliate against that person either. And then the, uh, <clears throat> the, the third thing that I'll go over here is um, there's also uh, one of the laws gives investigative authority to the Department of Taxation. Um, so specifically they will be the authorities looking at it. So you've got tax experts looking at tax cases. Um, they know what they're talking about. They know what they're looking for and they know all the ways around it. So in, in other words, it adds another layer of scrutiny, um, to any kind of worker misclassification proceeding. Um, these carry civil pen penalties that you would expect. Um, 
But, you know, I'd say on this last law, a couple interesting wrinkles, too. This last law about anti-retaliation, it also affects uh, contractors competing for, for public contracts. So if your company, a business that you work with, um, you know, uh, uses uh, or, or goes out for bid on public contracts, if you're found to have been misclassified, uh, misclassifying workers here, the Department of Taxation is going to notify all public bodies and covered institutions of your name or of your company's name. So you kind of got this scarlet letter law on the books uh, as well. So, um, you know, all this to say, I think the takeaways here is, again, Virginia was considered really pro-company. So, again, it was a bit of a surprise um, and a pivot. Man, now, if you're living in Virginia, you may have seen this coming. Um, but sort of to the rest of the, of the nation, it looked like uh, a little bit of a sea change here. And definitely something that if you are doing business in Virginia, you're going to want to certainly look at uh, any existing uh, contractor setups you have. You're going to want to look at your independent contract agreements and all that kind of run a full audit. Make sure that you're not going to be able, not going to be running afoul of, of any of these, um, of any of these laws. And that's Virginia. I think we can move to the next slide. So now we're going to talk about the great Northeast, uh, New York and New Jersey. These are always two to watch. Um, I'll, talk about New Jersey first, uh, but I will say when it comes to New York, it's, it's very interesting. Over the past you know, year, 18 months, uh, what we've really seen is that uh, there's two New Yorks. They're not really separate and apart from each other, uh, but they, they do different things and they have a big effect on, on business. So what I mean by that is you've got New York State and they're uh, working on enacting their own laws and, and, and regulations around worker misclassification. As I mentioned, Governor Cuomo it's very bullish on worker misclassification, always has been. Um, but then you have New York City, which is passing its own, own regulations that apply just within the city of New York. But because so much business is done in New York City, uh, the effects are widely felt. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But first, uh, let's talk about New Jersey. New Jersey passed a, a suite of worker misclassification laws um, end of January. Now, uh, one thing to note here is that this isn't going to be the end for New Jersey, so I'll unpack some of these here. Uh, but keep in mind that one of the actual laws that did not make it and pass on this session uh, was a law to codify California's version of the ABC test. So, you know, for whatever that means, if, if you um, are wary of it in California, uh, New Jersey, you know, it may very well be coming, you know, as well as New York. We could talk about that as well. Not there yet, but here's what is. Um, so the governor basically signed uh, you know, the worker misclassification package, as it's sort of known. That expands the authority of the, of the New Jersey DOL, Department of Labor, and, and broadens penalties for worker misclassification. Um, so what can it do? Well, it can issue stop work orders. Um, if a misclassification is suspected, stop work orders until... Um, you know, we get a determination. So that could slow down certain sectors. Um, this is that's probably more uh, around the construction um, construction industry um, than some other professional industries. Um, but it also adds additional penalties for misclassification uh, of workers of employees as well. So there's additional monetary penalties. Um, you know, again, as Patrick said, you see numbers, you see numbers, deficits in state coffers. Um, then you start to see some of these laws come around that are naming how much they're losing a year in revenue. And then they're citing to the penalty amounts. Um, and you start to think they're looking at this as lower hanging fruit and enforcement is to come. Um, so there are going to be, you know, penalty numbers here for misclassification. And those could range from, you know, 250 to a thousand, depending on the violation. Of course, if you're talking about a couple of, of uh, people, those penalties don't sound like a lot. Um, just know that in an audit situation, typically they're not coming to to just look at one or two workers. They're going to look at everybody, or at least everyone similarly situated, kind of make it worth their time. So those penalties can tend to add up. Um, there's also a joint and several liability uh, piece that they added. So for certain types of employers. Uh, who violate employer tax laws, they could be found to be joint employers. Uh, so th this works, we're going to talk about joint employment. This works if you think about um, sort of staffing, you know, where you have two people, you have a company that's providing employee 
a labor up to you. Uh, if they're guilty, you could be guilty too. So they've put that on the books. Um, and, and when I see this one, I think more to come on this. I'm not quite sure where this one's going to go, but I'm going to keep my eye on it because joint and several liability isn't always something that's strictly put on the books in this fashion. So I'm, I'm curious about how they plan to enforce that. Last thing I'll mention is there's, uh, again, anti-retaliation as part of this as well. So look, you know, you can't, um, if you're looking at some of these laws, like I think to go back to Virginia, you can certainly envision how uh, those three laws I went over, they can all be violated at, at, at one time, right? So if you want to go back to the uh, Virginia slide, I'll just kind of illustrate. So when these suites of, of laws come out, you think, okay, there's one, there's two, there's three, but you, you can envision scenarios where all three of them get violated at once. So if we're looking at Virginia, um, a civilian worker, things are being misclassified. They bring a lawsuit directly against the company. They also allege that they've been retaliated against or someone who's um, part of the investigation says that. So you've got the retaliation uh, claim. And, and then, of course, you know, you've got the investigative authority. If this is a public contract, uh, you might not get public contracts again. Uh, based on uh, a finding of misclassification. So, you know, we kind of look at them separately, but they can often work in tandem. So I try to read them both ways when I'm looking at it. Okay. Um, so to go back to the next slide here, New York. Uh, as I mentioned before, you've got New York City and you've got, and you've got New York. Now, before the pandemic sort of put, uh, at that time, New York uh, as the epicenter of the crisis, um, the uh, Governor Cuomo was marching forward uh, very swiftly towards uh, an ABC test. Um, that has since been delayed, and it and we don't know when it when we don't know when they're going to pick that back up. That said, I don't see why they wouldn't pick it back up. So you know, more to come probably next year around the ABC test uh, because Cuomo in his 2020 budget he created a, a worker classification task force. We're seeing a lot of states do this, too. It's, it's almost uh, a requisite. Before you do anything, the task force comes out. They start crunching the numbers to see how much your state is losing due to worker misclassification. And the next thing you know, laws are getting put on the books. So he put that task force out there. Um, and he had already proposed, as I said, modifying the New York labor law to codify the ABC test. Um, that law is still out there. I've read that law. The, the very first line on the very first page, uh, a stated purpose for that law is is to uh, reclassify more workers as employees rather than independent contractors in order for them to receive benefits such as health care and retirement. That There's the purpose. So, um, you know, he's looking to put a, a law on the books that's going to make more employees. This is often people's fear and, and criticism about the ABC test. You're just making everyone an employee. Well, make of it what you will, but th those are the literal words, as I just said, that are on page one of that. So if that does come back, um, be on the lookout, be on the lookout there, certainly. Uh, when we talk about New York City, let's, they already have uh, recently this year um, put on the books the ABC test, um, and that's for purposes really of the New York City Essential Workers and Rights Bill. This is on the table. Again, with uh, COVID, the pandemic, it has not passed, but it's still out there. Um, and this would, this would basically, among other things, use the ABC test to determine who's covered under the Earned Sick Time and Safe Time Act. So it would have far-reaching implications um, if that was to pass. Uh, I, don't see why, I don't see why it wouldn't coming next year. So you'll be on the lookout for that. I say that because New York City already has the Freelancers and Free Act, uh, which they passed, I believe, last year. And, and that requires companies in New York City to provide independent contractors with a written contract and timely payments in accordance with the terms of the contract. Those contracts have to be in writing. If they're over $800, they have to have these specifics. So you can see New York City uh, has already taken sort of a position on worker misclassification. And so that's why I say you've got the state and you've got the city. Um, they both seem to be heading in the same direction, but doing it at different times. So um, because New York City, again, so much business and industry is going through New York City, 
Uh, everyone has clients uh, uh, that they engage with there. These are things to be cognizant of. Think of them as two, two bits of information to keep in mind. Okay. Rob, I think also just to, bring up, just to bring up this, this point, um, yeah. when you look at Virginia and the fact that um, basically there, what they've said is, look, we're starting from the notion that anytime you're paying someone, they're an employee, right? And then everything that you're seeing um, in New York and New Jersey, what, what we're finding is other states are watching this closely and, and then um, either mimicking or taking um, the foundation of what they're seeing other states do and then build from that. That's why even if you don't have independent contractors in these states, um, it's important to kind of watch and know what's going on because we're seeing more and more states adopt similar legislation. I just wanted to inject that really quick. I think that's I think that's right. And I think, you know, um, thinking that you're only doing business these days in one state. Away, most of us are doing business in all the states, many yeah. of the states. And, you know, you don't really know, particularly if you're engaged in independent contractors, Patrick, to add. Keep in mind that contractor location. You don't necessarily know when you you may be in Utah and they may be in Virginia and you may just not be tracking that from that perspective. Yeah, very true. All right, everybody. So we are going to do our first poll of the day. So uh, just a reminder from the instructions at the beginning, we're going to look at the polling widget in the right hand side of the webcast viewer and then just uh, plug your your votes in and if you haven't already you can take a minute to set up your um to set up your account with poll everywhere but uh it's pretty fast and easy so go ahead and do that and uh the question we're wanting an answer to today is how prepared is your organization to be compliant given all of the changes that have occurred in 2020 uh very prepared somewhat prepared or unprepared um, and, uh, so I think, uh, I think we're going to be very interested to see the results here. Okay. Great. We've got some coming in already. Um, uh, so it seems like we're kind of a split between very prepared or somewhat prepared. What, uh, does that, uh, uh, Patrick and, uh, and Rob, does that reflect what you see when you talk to people in the market? It, I'll start us off, Rob. Um, it, yeah. it does. We, we, we're seeing more and more organizations get proactive about this mm -hmm. uh, because because there is so much change. And, um, and and so I'm not surprised to see the very prepared, you know, up around half of the organizations. Also, just as a note on, on the somewhat prepared, it, it's so hard. Like when you take a look at Virginia, just how fast the legislation was actually introduced to when it was made a law and went active. Um, you're talking about months. And, and so it, it's really difficult for organizations now um, to be fully prepared all the time because things happen so quickly. It moves so fast. So um, this seems to be in line with, with what we're seeing. Rob? Yeah. Well, Patrick, I like to think that the, the very prepared portion are, are thinking – they're very prepared because they're listening to us right now and we've, we're, we're making them feel better rather than worse. So that, <laughs> that's, that's not a bad, I'll just take that for what it is. Um, but I think, uh, I think, I think you're right. Uh, we're, I think everyone knows that there's an issue. And so um, there is something being done. And most of the, the client organizations that, that we speak to when we're going out on these speaking uh, engagements, um, but kind of what to do specifically, I think is where, you know, well, it's where we come in, but it's, that's where it gets a little muddy for, for organizations. Excellent. Well, uh, I think we're going to take it back to the main presentation and keep on going here. Uh, very interesting results so far. Sure. Uh, all right, Robert, Rob, take it away. Yes. Thank you. So now we're going to talk about joint and, and co-employment. Um, this is, this is something we've had a lot of activity in the current year uh, around joint co-employment. More than usual, usually you get some agency guidance uh, things come out. Um, in this case, we're having firm regulations being uh, promulgated, put out by the Department of Labor and the National Labor Relations Board. Um, so I'm going to unpack some of, those, some of those standards. I think what, what is to know high level globally is that uh, the standards that have come out have sort of 
mm, soften what came before them. Uh, and by that, I mean, they will make these new regulations should make less joint employment uh, issues. Uh, there should be less findings that you are, your company is a joint employer uh, than, than what came before them. So, you know, good news if you're an organization, uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll dig in a little more. So um, you know, joint employment really becomes an issue where one or more entities can be considered a worker's employer. So, you know, think staffing. You're being supplied, uh, you know, you've got your agreements in place, uh, but the work being done is for the benefit of you or you are your staffing and you find the, the employee and you pass it on to your end client. This is going to be where joint employment comes up. Um, <clears throat> so if we start with uh, the Department of Labor, we can go through what they've done. So they have, uh, it was, yeah, in March, they came up with a four-part balancing test to determine whether a business is a joint employer. So a business will be found to be a joint employer based on the following four, uh, four prongs. Hires or fires the employee, supervises and controls the employee's work schedule or conditions of employment to a substantial degree, determines the employee's rate and method of payment, and four, maintains the employee's employment records. It's a balancing test. No single factor is dispositive. It's just in there. So this is good because it is straightforward. It's for uh, pieces. Um, <clears throat> of course, there, there's still room for debate. You know, maybe that's the lawyer in me, you know, what, what constitutes a substantial degree, you know, things like that. You know, there are all these things that you can litigate uh, against. But it's clear that the intent of this uh, new test is to relax the risk that you will be found a, a joint employer. So that that is the intent. I'll give you a couple examples. So actual control uh, is required. So reserve control is not enough. What does that mean? If you're a joint employer, you actually have to be exhibiting uh, substantial control over that worker. It's not just that you have a contract with a staffing company or something like that. That would be looked at as reserve control. So that will not make you uh, a joint employer. Um, likewise. Ordinary sound business practices are not evidence of joint employment. What does that mean? Well, if you require a background check, that doesn't make you someone's joint employer. Um, if there are other legal obligations that need to be, you know, uh, 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 that need to be put out there and completed, like to protect the health and safety, so policies that your company may have uh, do not make you a joint employer, even if you make that person that you get from the staffing company adhere to them. Um, so those those things aren't going to do it. It was tenuous before this rule, whether that would or wouldn't. So that's why, uh, that's why those are noteworthy. All right. And so that's generally the Department of Labor's rule. And, and the FLSA, I should say, you know, that covers your minimum wage and your overtime. But that's what you're looking at there. Uh, now we'll talk a bit about the NLRB, uh, which uh, governs the National Labor Relations Act. This is really uh, focused on, that act is focused on the right to collectively bargain and, uni and unionize. So if you're found to be a joint employer under the NLRA, um, now you have a responsibility to collectively bargain, you know, with, with uh, maybe your staffing company's workers. You don't want to have to do that. Um, <clears throat> so what is it that they've done? They've rolled back uh, the standard to pre-2015. Um, in 2015, you've got on there, Brown, there was a Browning Ferris standard that came out that really expanded, um, who could be a joint employer. It was going to be far more inclusive. Uh, you, you could, ex you didn't have to exercise direct control over the worker to be found to be a joint employer. What the NLRB has done is roll that standard back to pre-2015. So now to be a joint employer under the final rule, a business must possess and exercise substantial direct and immediate control over one or more of the essential terms and conditions of employment of another employer's employees. Um, it does define this. So if you're interested in this and want to know more, or you're like me and just read this stuff for, you know, fun, I guess, Patrick, I could say entertainment. Is that what? <laughs> but uh, <Yeah. laughs> uh, you, it, there, there is good information about this. There is definitions of key terms, like as, essential terms and conditions of employment. What is direct and what isn't direct and immediate control? So uh, if, <clears throat> if you are uh, the kind of company that could be in a joint employment food chain, and really I, most, most larger companies can be to some extent, uh, you'll want to 
read up on, um, on some of those definitions as well. Uh, lastly, the EEOC um, is they're now looking, they never have before, to my knowledge, uh, they've never looked to apply uh, or issue its own standards for when joint employment exists. They look to be doing it. They haven't done it yet, but they look to be preparing to do that. And that would cover uh, when joint employment exists under federal anti-discrimination laws. So again, very active time for joint and co-employment. Yeah, and Rob, just to just to inject one thing here, and, and by the way, I am glad that you find this this topic riveting, uh, just to to help keep us up on all of it. <laughs> um, but we did have a really large uh, global organization uh, that we're working with come to us a few weeks ago, and and you know the the question was unique, but it was basically, hey, talk to us about um, talk to us about the impact of 1099s and co-employment. And, and typically you don't hear those two things together. Um, it might be with W-2 payroll workers and co-employment, but typically not with 1099s. And, and it was a really good dialogue um, around the fact that with 1099s, you, you're, you really typically are safeguarded unless you have misclassified. Then you've got a, yeah. a significant challenge on your hands as it relates to co-employment. Yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. So, sometimes it is, uh, you know, it is confused where, you know, where that, that line is and does, does joint employment have to do with independent contracting? Technically, no. I mean, the Department of Labor in their, in that recent, recently, you know, promulgated test, they even, um, have a, a provision or a portion of it that says that, you know, this, this standard doesn't apply. It kind of cleaves independent contractor, their worker misclassification test away from this so sort of to, to make that point. Like these two things are different. Um, so keep it, keep it that way. And interestingly enough, uh, in a few slides here, Patrick, we're going to talk about a, a case with FedEx that really exhibits that point of you're all good from a joint employment perspective, unless somebody says somebody's misclassified <laughs> and you're not so good. Yeah. That's right. All right. Um, yeah. So we can move ahead to some case law. So I'm all move. I know you know time is is uh, increasingly growing short here. I will move through some of these. Um, we'll start with California. Haven't we had enough of California? Right. I live in California, so I know wherever I speak. Um, so I think we're all pretty pretty flooded um, with California uh, cases. But California does remain a minefield of activity. Um, it's laws and cases. They're widely reported on nationally. And they, they have effects on wherever you do business. And that's what we're seeing here. Um, and I can, but I, I should say, because I still can say that I see still exist in California. Uh, we work with them every day. So uh, we're all working within the current regulatory uh, scheme. If that, uh, if that legal uh, field should change, uh, we'll change with it pretty quick. Uh, we did when this came around and, and we're, we're preparing to do that, you know, as changes come. So what are some of the few things going on? Well, you know, I mean, they're really these on-demand companies like, like we know of. So um, just in the court, it feels like two years, really, Patrick, the, you know, the, but it's only yeah. been a half a year here for wow. California. Um, but, but in these few <laughs> six or seven months, uh, we've seen a lot happen. Lots of confusion. Lawmakers scrambling to amend or repeal AB5 businesses uh, such as shipping companies imposing California compliance surcharges to offset sort of the risk of doing business here with AB5. Um, we've seen contractors rushing to form LLCs, believing that this is going to shield them from AB5. Uh, that, that's It's not necessary, by the way, to, to form an LLC. Um, and, and then some, so there's a lot. Within that, there's been some um, definite actions to take note of. And while these are about gig and on-demand, again, the effects are far reaching. The press covers it heavily. <clears throat> uh, things, things happen based on what's going on in California. So um, in January, Instacart in San Diego, there was a, a lawsuit there. The San Diego, uh, city of San Diego sued Instacart. Um, the attorney general, this, this is all based on AB5. I should say AB5 has a provision in it that allows a city attorney or an attorney general to bring a suit uh, directly against companies. Um, this is significant in that um, a city is less likely, uh, if at all, to ever settle. You know, whereas when a private plaintiff, um, a driver, 
brings a, a, a case against Lyft or something or Uber, well, likelihood's going to settle, right? Um, it may take time. It may be costly. It's going to settle. In this case, what they're looking for is a reclassification, you know, straight, straight off reclassification. And that's what San Diego is looking to do to Instacart drivers. Um, that, that fight is still ongoing, not over. In March, as I mentioned, uh, Proposition 22, and this is the proposition uh, funded by Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash, um, uh, was officially on the books to be voted upon in November. So it's now Proposition 22, and, and, and should this pass, it will exclude app-based drivers from AB5. Uh, it'll establish them as, as independent contractors. Over a million signatures on this didn't take long. All they needed was 623,000, got over a million. So it says sort of this polarizing AB5 environment that we're in. Um, we'll see. But keep in mind, you know, that, that just applies to those drivers. Um, it doesn't apply. You know, what would happen based on that is I could probably talk you know, individually about that for, for a while. But that happened. In May, the California Attorney General went ahead and sued Uber and Lyft uh, around AB5 as well. This has been widely reported on. There's, I don't know how many drivers in this state for, for uh, Uber and Lyft, and they're seeking 2,500 per violation. That's got to add up real quick. Um, and that goes to the state's, really, I think, to the state's bottom line. Um, but again, they're looking to, you know, prohibit what has been standard practice of these drivers being independent contractors. In the meanwhile, you know, uh, we've had truck drivers look to get exempted from AB5. We have freelance riders looking to do the same. Um, you have the California Public Utilities Commission, which sort of monitors the transportation industry. They've ruled that Uber and Lyft are, uh, drivers are employees under AB5. And you have these, so you have this really steady state. Uh, it, just in July, a couple of days ago, um, the California Labor Commissioner, and then they jumped in. So you've got the city's attorneys, you've got the California Attorney General, and now you've got the California Labor Commission that took on, um, I think, Los Angeles on demand gig car wash, you know, somewhere that, you know, a nice innovative uh, technology. Maybe they come wash your car, you bring them, I don't know. But they're taking them on under AB5, so you need to reclassify all these people as well. So it is spreading. Um, and, you know, so more activity. And like I said, it has legs uh, around the nation. All right. Well, that is California. Always entertaining. Uh, quickly on, on Massachusetts. I bring up Massachusetts for a couple of reasons. Um, one, Massachusetts has had California's version of the ABC test, albeit it's a little different. Uh, California's version has a lot written about it, a long law, lots of exceptions. For the most part, uh, the uh, Massachusetts test is those three prongs, and there's an attorney general guidance around that. But, you know, so different in, um, you know, stated exceptions and things like that. But I bring this up because on July 14th, really, the Massachusetts attorney general, uh, she sued Uber and Lyft, too. Very similar to what California did. Okay. Um, I, a couple of noteworthy things here. What we've been telling people is the AB5 effect. If states that have had this test or a test or no test are all going to be looking at their enforcement environment and laws anew. If you had a strict test, you're probably going to start, well, our thought was you're going to start enforcing that harsher than you were before. Case in point, the Massachusetts Attorney General you know, this book, uh, the law has been on the books, ABC test in Massachusetts, you know, for, you know, 17 years or so. Uber and Lyft have uh, continuously worked in, in uh, operated within Massachusetts for what, I don't know, since inception of their business model. Um, and now, January, July 14th, the AG sues them. So this, again, says that people are, uh, states are going to be reinforcing or enforcing these um, by the letter and maybe they weren't exactly doing that before so you can't just say massachusetts already had this so what's to see here no they're going out and they're operationalizing it and they're enforcing it anew i would say um the other thing i like about this is is it's the announcement took place on a zoom meeting as you can see from the slide and i found that completely of the now and uh i had to bring that up because you know it tells you that Legislators are really just like us at heart, uh, still stuck behind their laptops and Zoom meetings, even doing this this very weighty business. Not that all of our business is weighty, right, Patrick? Yes. Um, 
so that that's Massachusetts. Um, we'll move quickly on Pennsylvania again, being respective of time here. So Pennsylvania and, and FedEx, FedEx had a string of cases that they had to settle for probably over half a billion dollars a couple of years ago. And that, that those were worker misclassification um, proceedings saying that their drivers were contractors or were, were employees, but they were paying them as independent contractors. Okay. So uh, they settled those and FedEx launched another business model. This business model, basically it was the joint employment sort of model. So instead of FedEx um, contracting with workers directly, they sort of set up um, another layer that would set up these drivers and the drivers would have drivers under them. So it was kind of like almost a staffing thing or, or definitely a layer between them. They figured this would be a way to sort of contain some of that risk. Um, <clears throat> what's happened is uh, some of those drivers, sort of the, the sub uh, contractors, if you will, under FedEx um, were potentially misclassified. They were paying those drivers under them as independent contractors and not employees, even though FedEx's paperwork says they all have to be employees. So Patrick, as you said, this is that case um, where now that you've got misclassification somewhere along the food chain, it, it, it becomes a joint employment problem for FedEx and they're dealing with that right now. So really the takeaways there are, you know, yeah, a couple things, really. Make sure your paperwork is sound. Not that FedEx's was, and I'm sure it was. Uh, but also really know that the uh, parties that you're going to be subcontracting with are going to follow, adhere to that paperwork. So, you know, audit um, those frequently as well so that you don't get into any kind of joint employment issues. All right. So, you know, Patrick, where are we going? You know, we've, we've kind of put all this out there. You've seen in a short amount of time how many things have happened. Uh, more changes to come. There may be a brief slowdown as we head towards year end for sure. Uh, but then I think after that, you know, it picks up as, as, as things progress. Um, if you move to the next slide, will there be a new class of worker? We only have two classes of workers here in the United States. That is a W-2 person um, and a 1099 person, an independent contractor and an employee. That's what we have. Um, is it, are we far, far afield from the reality of uh, wor the working world? Well, I mean, if you look at some of the headlines, th this is kind of happening around us. Um, economists from the Harvard Business Review, that article, economists are saying it makes sense to give um, gig workers benefits. Um, the CARES Act, well, we talked about that, the federal government providing employee benefits to non-employees. You have businesses, you have cities that are also uh, providing employee type protections to people that they're nonetheless not withholding taxes for, uh, independent contractors. So these are exactly against what you're supposed to do with independent contractors. It's courting danger. But, you know, it says that times have changed. Classifications should, should change as well. Um, you know, I would add to that, too, that even the New York Court of Appeals, there was a recent case where Postmates uh, delivery uh, team were found to be employees. And um, in, a, in an opinion, the, the, the second, uh, the, excuse me, the New York Court of Appeals, some of those, some of the judges in there said, yes, they're employees, but the tests are really, I'm paraphrasing here, the tests are really outdated, old and stale, and we need other classifications, other tests. So you're seeing that in some of the major courts as well. To the next slide, please. What would the new quasi IC look like? Well, well, we don't we don't know, but we do know that there seem to be prevailing reasons to have it. Um, our current classification system just doesn't reflect the times. It confuses parties who want to comply, and if you're confused, you might bury your head in the sand, and then that courts risk. Um, it just keeps businesses from from reconsidering on their own. How can we best engage? How can we come, become that engagement party of choice for independent contractors? Well, it'd be nice to give them some kind of benefits. Uh-oh, that looks like they're employees. Let's not do that. Um, so that, that, that isn't productive as well. And there are, there are sort of um, templates that we could draw upon from other countries like Canada and the UK. They, they've sought to address these changing work environments too. So it's been done. Um, the question is, should we be doing it here? Or are we all right? in some ways. I think yeah, good point, Rob. And I, <clears throat> it, you know, it's 
it's amazing just how much discussion there there is about this. This is um, a true core topic right now. Um, and, and I think we're going to see the discussion um, continue on this. So I, you know, I look forward to, to seeing how this progresses. Um, just because it, it's it's hard to believe that we've kind of gotten to this point where there might be actually be a new classification of worker. And once again, everybody, it's going to be we're going to do another quick poll here, just in the last final minutes. So. Uh, same deal as last time. I'm not going to go through the instructions again, but uh, this time we're looking to know, based on your current and future talent needs, would a new class worker have a place in your organization? So uh, the options are up there. I'm not, uh, you know, it could be I'm unsure, no, two glasses are better for us, uh, or yes, we're long overdue. So with that, let's take a quick look at the results here. Okay, everybody's uh sounding off already uh so so guys what do you think uh seems like most people are unsure or the plurality are unsure and then everybody else is kind of somewhere in between yeah yeah i think that i think that's fair that uh, to to be unsure about it you know i think some of the business considerations to to think about as well are you know again how do i become that engagement party of choice uh, i wish i could treat my contingent workforce a little better you know so that they want to come back um and these are things that under the current two uh, classifications you really are coached to not do gotcha all right well let's uh swap back over to the slides here and we'll uh uh we'll take uh, uh we'll go through the next couple of slides and get to any questions we can yeah so, um, Alan, if you want to move forward, yeah, if you want to move forward one more, um, I think just really some key things to think about, and then let's get into the questions, is, you know, with, with all of this change, how do you safeguard your organization? And I, I think the main thing is um, just make sure that you're consistently auditing um, your, your own population, analyzing your own population, um, really work to, to make sure that you're keeping up with all the ongoing compliance changes. And don't forget that case law that we that we talked about. The reason case law can can kind of creep up on you is it takes existing laws, but it just shows that courts are interpreting those existing laws differently. And so we're seeing a lot of that. And um, if, if for some reason that's tough to wrap your arms around, and, and for most organizations it just is because there's so much going on with uh, going on with 1099 compliance, then partner with a specialist to, to try to figure out um, exactly maybe where you sit today and what your strategy should be to to ensure 100% compliance and to ensure that you're safeguarding your organization. And, and I know we have just a few minutes here, uh, but Alan, we'd love to answer any questions that, that people might have. Absolutely. So uh, I got a couple already and uh, just to... <clears throat> Uh, I think we can go through these pretty quick. So uh, one from Julie. Uh, Julie is asking, could you guys restate those four, uh, the, the FLSA four-part test uh, uh, once again for them? Yeah, Rob, do you want to handle that? Uh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, So you're going to have a balancing test there. And uh, those four will be specifically, do you hire or fire the employee? Do you supervise and control the employee's work schedule or conditions of employment to a substantial degree? Do you determine the employee's rate and method of payment? Do you maintain the employee's employment records? It's a balancing test, so no one factor is dispositive. Perfect. So um, uh, uh, another one, uh, here's a comment from Connor. He says, one rule of thumb I've heard is who is asking who is ultimately benefiting the most, the employee or contractor. Do we see a trend in contractors, employees, employers erring on the side of caution with reclassifying folks as employees? So if, you know, it's a tie, do you just err on the side of employee because it's less trouble that way? Yeah, it's it's a really interesting point, um, and, and so we do some or we do see some organizations um, taking that approach of you know what just to be safe I, I'm you know I'm going to make this um, a, a W two um, you know and, but with that with making them a W two um, th there's certainly risks with with doing that as well 
but sometimes much safer than, than going the 1099 route. So I think the reality is in day-to-day -day business operations, the answer is yes, we do see organizations um, doing that. Uh, but, but I think the reality is ultimately we see companies just wanting to make the right decision and, and the mm -hmm. best decision. Um, and so trying to interpret that specific engagement and aligning it up with the, the legislation and case law in your state and, and federally um, to get to the right decision is really what's optimal there. But, but that, it is a reality that we do see companies just sometimes throw their hands up and say, I don't know, I feel like it might be a little safer to, to go the W2 route, so I'm just going to do that. You know, that, that, but then that certainly does open you up more to that, that co-employment uh, issue. Excellent. Well, we have come to the end of our time together today, unfortunately, but I do want to remind all HCI members watching that today's webcast has been approved for HRCI, SHRM credit, and HCI recertification credit. Your credits for attending this webcast will soon show up in your uh, My HCI dashboard. Uh, if you look at that screenshot there, if you click in the upper right hand corner of your screen, you'll be able to uh, access your dashboard there, just then click on learning, then click on down tra download transcript, and you'll get the codes for uh, whatever organization you're working with on your recertification. And while you're there, don't forget to check out hci.org for even more free content, as well as information on our certifications and events. I would also like to thank one, say one more thank you to our presenters to get today. Uh, we got some good comments in the Q&A that I didn't get to, but um, I, I think the audience uh, is very appreciative of what you guys were able to put together and deliver. And uh, I also want to, of course, thank the good people at Talent Wave for making the entire thing possible. And lastly, I'm going to thank you, the audience, the webcast viewer. Thank you for spending your valuable time with us. Uh, we know that you have lots of choices about what to do with your day, especially now that you're probably working from home, but we appreciate the fact that you chose to spend a part of it with us. So with that, I'll say stay safe, keep your stick on the ice, and we'll see you next time.